and welcome to the IGX 2019 live stream. We are here at IGX in Danvers, Massachusetts. I'm Patrick McCaffrey with the Hemacast. And I'm TQ with New Cross Historical Fencing. And we're going to be your broadcasters for the day. Um, I will be providing color commentary and uh, trying to explain as much as I can. And I'll be adding some more technical detail, especially for Lichtenauer fencers, uh, as Patrick's a Fiori guy. Yep. Though I am a little bilingual, I do speak a little Lichtenauer. You know at least three words. At least three words. Um, what is it? Vor, Nock, and Indes? Those are three words you got to worry about. Pretty much. All right. So our list of events for tonight. We are going to start with a historical weapons, or sorry, historical wrestling exhibition. We will have three exhibition matches, followed by mixed weapons, beginner longsword, women's longsword, open longsword. And the mixed weapons through open longsword will all be semifinals and finals. Yep. It's going to be some good fencing. The open longsword pool in particular, field in particular, was a very large group of people, so getting to the top of it is going to mean some really interesting fights after that. Definitely. There were 60 fighters today in the open longsword. Um, and the order of the, the event today was an open longsword pool, an open longsword pool followed by an eliminations pool. Yeah. So the eliminations pools in particular took 30 fighters down into just four for the finals. Very tight, very hard work. All right, a quick overview of the rules from the longsword and the mixed weapons. Both of our fighters started with five points. Getting hit costs a point equal to the value of the target. And That's there were four passes. two points for a head hit uh, or a body thrust and one point for anything else. So if you cut to the body, cut to the leg, cut to the arm, one they were all one. worth one point. And throws, I think, are two points with clear dominant position. Yes. Or one point if they're super messy. Uh, so if you fall on your own, it was one point for the other person. So you had to stay on your feet. And this is an indoor turf. Um, it's a little slippier than like in uh, a basketball court or a wrestling gym, something like that but not quite as slippy as uh, an ice rink. Or an ice rink. No, it's, an, it's a very acceptable floor here, actually. Yeah, it Plenty is. Plenty of traction for any sort of movement. Yeah, uh, as long as you keep your feet under you. Um, the big, the big um, thrusts and whatnot are a little harder to recover from just because the push off. You have to properly bring your feet back in, into position before your, the other guy takes your head off. Yep. So, Every time one of our fighters gets hit, they are going to lose either one or two points. If both fighters get hit, both fighters can lose points. At the end of four passes, whoever has the most points will win. So, at the end of the fight, the fighter with the higher score is awarded victory points equal to the difference in scores. If the fight is clean, i.e. there are no doubles or afterblows, both fighters are awarded an additional victory point. This uh, aspect of the rules was primarily relevant for the pool phase. Here, when we're in direct eliminations and finals, it won't be quite as important. Sure. Simply whoever has most is going to end up winning. Yep. Though, to get here, you had to fight cleanly. Um, Absolutely. Because you start with five points and have four passes. So, in an ideal situation, you can end with all five of your points still and the other person having zero points. At which point you can get an extra point, in fact, from your clean fencing. Yep. And there was a special rule for the open longsword pools today. There was a technical point that was awarded. These technical points were an additional point for a... Clear control of the opponent's weapon or clear lockout of their ability to fence while you made your hits. So fencing not just in a way that avoided the afterblow, but entirely prevented it. Yep. Um, so grabbing the opponent's sword arm, uh, physically turning them away and controlling the body, throwing them to the ground and staying in a dominant position with your sword present. Yeah. Um, the or straight thrusts with lockout or similar actions. I was going to say countercuts with strong opposition. The traditional absets in or yeah. zornhau. Um, Anything like that could easily get technical points, and I believe there's an extra prize for the fencer who achieved the most. Yes. Uh, that will be rewarded later. And I believe that's going to be announced probably at the dinner afterwards. They might announce it during this, but... 
Well, we'll find out. We will. All right. While we have a little bit of time before we get started, we're going to uh, plug our sponsors. Events like these are really done through the help of the community, and the community includes sponsors. Our first sponsor is HEMA Supplies. Uh, HEMA Supplies supplies HEMA gear. Uh, they are, I believe, the U.S.-based company. They're a U.S.-based company and the mainstay distributor for sparring gloves and regenia fetters, particularly over in this, on this side of the pond. All right. Our next sponsor is going to be Combat Con. Combat Con is an event held in Las Vegas every year. I believe it's held in September. I think or it's a little August. earlier. I think it's in July. Often. July. But I, I'll check the dates in a minute. All right. And we'll get that added later. Yep. Our next sponsor is one that most fighters will know about. It's Spez Historical Fencing. Uh, Spez Historical Fencing gear is probably the standard for most fencers starting out. Um, they Spez jackets, Spez ring and jackets, Spez gloves. You can see all of them all over the place in this tournament. And they're the standard for a reason. They are some of the best equipment that you can get started on. Um, I've personally just switched over to the Spez officer's jacket, which I enjoy as a, combina as a uh, compromise between the JF fencing jacket and the, uh, the AP light. Our next sponsor is PBT Historical Fencing. I just switched to using their breeches, actually. Um, PBT are a, a long-time sports fencing company, and they, in recent years, have added a historical fencing line after discussions with some of the Eastern European community. Um, it's got a really great balance of mobility and protection, and also a really pleasant range of sizes compared to a lot of HEMA gear. You can get a gigantic range of sizes, custom fits, everything you need. Exactly, and it's great. It's great having the custom sizing, yeah, it really is. All right, our next sponsor is Castile Armory. Castile Armory provides swords and fetters for HEMA. Uh, they provide a really great uh, baseline sword, be it a fetter for longsword, a uh, rapier. Side sword, anything at all. This is Ian Crow of oh, Forte Swordplay, I believe. Yes, with Forte Swordplay. I'd like to kind of acknowledge the sponsors who are here, and before they run away, one of our longest running sponsors, and quite frankly, a wonderful asset to have here for everyone here that likes to break or stuff they need or stuff they want to try on, Purple Heart Armory. Those of you who saw 
saw the Facebook post, they provided an absolutely spectacular looking messer, complete with an engraved leather scabbard with the IGX logo on it. And someone from this mixed weapon fight coming up is going to win. <laughs> this year is a little different. So normally the prizes go to one person and that's their prize, like a book or something. He's provided discount codes that go to everyone in your club. So if your club member wins one of his prizes, every one of you gets a discount on his website. Back sponsors a little bit later. Thank you. So we are now moving to the uh, 
historical wrestling exhibition. All right, so Ian Davis and Patrick Breitenbach are going to be doing a demonstration right now. These are two fewerists who do wrestling, historical wrestling. In fact, I believe one of them just won the gold medal in his weight class. Yes. So they really know what they're about. Um, this is actually very interesting because they're looking at some of the differences in the way rule sets uh, affect the interpretation and practice of wrestling, allowing different uh, techniques uh, into or restricting them from the, f from the fight. And rewarding said techniques. Yeah. So what they're doing right now is they're demonstrating how it generally is done yeah. in Ringen today. And a lot of Ringen, and the, the frustration for Fiorists is a lot of the actions in the Abertzare aren't allowed because they wind up being strikes or joint man manipulation. <laughs> So this is based on, I believe, the rules we used here. Um, throws are worth two points, ring outs are worth one, um, is roughly the scoring. Uh, sacrifice throws are largely forbidden. You can see the two fighters are jockeying for position and trying to. Oh, that is a beautiful take. That was a lovely try. And they're back up and doing it again. So currently they're fighting for grips on the jackets, um, Ringen and Abritzari, and most... Oh, oh nice. that was an excellent throw as well. So a lot of historical wrestling... wrestling are jacketed arts, um, which give you some very different options for gripping and controlling the opponent. Um, modern wrestling like judo uh, has some similar parallels, but uh, collegiate wrestling as practiced over here in America can become a bit different because of the inability to control the upper arm or so with a simple grip on the jacket. Yeah. So what they're doing now is they are adding an additional action that is not in and of itself a scoring action, but it's setting up for other things. And these are going to be arm locks or joint locks. The first one was the middle bind or Ligadora Mazzana. Second one is lower bind or the strong bind. And this third one is going to be a standing arm bar, either the Russian or the four variations. <laughs> the, uh, the ballistic arm bar like that is very mean, as is that standing arm bar. So the ones they've removed are the ones where they're most likely to, instead of being able to control the opponent with the bar, uh, to simply break their elbow. Which yeah. is obviously a very practical technique in serious fighting, but simply infeasible in any sort of friendly or sportive competition. If we break our friends, we can't fight with them. Absolutely. So one of the things that you wind up seeing... You can see that here he's applying one of his... Uh, he was applying one of his binds to the left arm of Black Jacket. Throw. That was a well-placed throw, and again, these are being set up. Maybe the arm bars themselves are not setting up a specific throw, but they are... He's used it. 
you can there see here, is. to control the balance oh. of his opponent and then bring him to the floor. Excellent. I was about to say, the arm bars don't necessarily lead to a throw, but they lead to a change in how you can approach. They give you extra options for manipulating the balance and position of your opponent, um, which is critical for setting up any sort of throw in, uh, in wrestling. Otherwise, you simply get thrown when you try and step in. And they need to take a moment to uh, catch their breath. This might look gentle, uh, but wrestling is an extremely hard full body workout. Um, it is and really will flatten people. Uh, 30 seconds of wrestling is very different than 30 seconds of sword fighting. Oh, yes. We both had uh, matches in our pools where we did 20 or so seconds of wrestling as part of the fencing, and it really takes it out of you compared to any of the other matches I fenced today. Oh, yeah. I was absolutely exhausted after I wound up uh, in, a, in a good grapple at the sword. All right, now you're seeing that they have added strikes. Strikes are non-scoring actions. And specifically, they've only added open-handed strikes. Um, interestingly, there's actually very little evidence for punches historically. Uh, they're a, an action that seemed to have been invented later or become a common practice later. Mm -hmm. One of the caveats for the open-handed striking. Um, well done. In addition to it not being a scoring action, you cannot do an open-handed strike directly at the face. Yes. So no punching actions. So, so you'll the see they're instead the slapping around to the back of the side of the head or similar to establish a grip on the collar and take control of the neck. Oh, another that was good throw. When you introduce slapping like that, not only do you have to worry about your foot positioning, but you have to worry about what's coming at your head. And you'll notice how they're no longer uh, establishing grips directly, but now they're fighting very directly to even have the opportunity to grip the other person's jacket. Yep. There is evidence, historical evidence in the manuals that strikes like that and wrestling like that was a historical thing. Um, in Fiore's What It Takes to Be a Good Wrestler, he mentions strikes, binds, ligatures, and it's, it's just a, um, it's a part of the art that we don't really get to do, mostly just because it's... Uh, Safety and practical concerns, but yeah. especially with two skilled wrestlers, it really can play very nicely. <laughs> so, what we are going to be watching now is uh, Eddie Lewis and Anthony Bonomo. Eddie is here from the Boston area, and Anthony is up from Texas. They are going to be doing uh, structured sparring. The goal is to show off throws without static defense. This is a way to train a technique while focusing on explosion and developing the ability to identify and attack openings. This would be akin to if T and I grabbed gloves and a mask and a fetter and, and started playing around. drill, focusing on recognizing and taking opportunities. They're not trying to go at tournament speed. They're not trying to do anything more than... Oh. oh. Now that was nice. That was pretty. Even with the slightly reduced intensity, they're doing three full minutes, uh, which is a really very serious workout. And nice you can see... Picture. You can see they're looking to get that opening. They're... Because it's a free play, oh, that was a nice leg kick, yeah. turning into a throw. Because they're doing free play, they have a little bit more opportunity to try things out that are a little bit more um, adventurous or dangerous to, you know, an opening. Different ways to enter throws. So Eddie here is trying to make a hit. Oh, the white reached it, but just took a direct shove and said to take him down. Like pick. Oh, nearly. Reversal. Oh, my. That man is quick on his feet. <laughs> <laughs> so in the rule set, that would count as a sacrifice throw, and they would actually 
that would have been a point to uh, Eddie Lewis there in the red shorts in the uh, in the tournament that they ran earlier. Mm -hmm. And that was a beautiful reversal. Again. So sometimes when you're uh, grappling, you will get into a point where falling is inevitable. And but you can and change the relationship between the two of you in the air to put them on the bottom or leave yourself in a more advantageous position after the fall. Mm -hmm. The table has just said that they have been wrestling for two minutes and they are having Still fun. Going. They're having fun, but they're slowing down a little bit. Yeah. Oh, wow. So one of the really important things in any sort of wrestling or throwing is taking, breaking your opponent's balance and structure before you try and uh, take them off the floor. And you can see that when they're just stepping straight in for the throw, it very rarely moves. When they already have them off balance before, then they fall very quickly. This is just a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, uh, this is fantastic. The last throw, maybe. Let's see if anyone makes it. Oh, jockeying for position, just that couldn't get at the end. That was beautiful fencing. Fencing wrestling. Fighting. Whatever. Fighting. So they're going to roll up the uh, the grappling mats there. And while they're rolling up the grappling mats, uh, we're just going to briefly mention some of our event sponsors. So our event sponsors include Albion Swords, Sword Squatch, Fect Yeah with Rogue Fencing, Lord Baltimore's Challenge, Arms and Armor, The Wicked Hour, Destroyer Mods, the U.S. Historical Ring and Association, Brass Frog, Fallen Rook, and Hema Strong. Each of these are a part of the community that really not only... Contributes a great deal. Not only do they provide items, but they also provide services. Fect yet is a... Item services and knowledge. And knowledge, yes. Fallen Rook provides books. Fect yet provides um, a tournament for women to fight in, specifically women. Lord and a very highly regarded one by all accounts. It's one of the events I'm really looking forward to checking out next year. Yes, they, they do a well, very good job. So we have moved on to our mixed weapons tournament. This is the semifinal match between Alex Kotorakis and Derek Weiss. Alex Kotorakis is with New Hampshire KDF and Derek Weiss is with Boston Armatsare. This is a change from last year. Last year they ran simply the gold and bronze medal matches, and now we're running semi-finals as well, which will make it take a bit longer, but also makes the elimination bracket significantly more interesting. So as we said, the uh, format for the tournament was you had five lives and you lost points as you got hit. Uh, this, and then the point differential determined your overall ranking, but in this one we're doing a uh, if you win, you move on to the first and second place match. If you lose, you move on to the third and fourth place match. So it's a little bit different than the way the pools were run, only in the fact that the pools were... About point accumulation, and here it's about direct elimination. Yep. As so, with any mixed one-handed weapons tournament, uh, rapier fencers did very well in this, and both of the finalists here are using rapiers, or indeed a pair of rapiers. So with our mixed weapon tournament, it was one-handed weapons, and you could use any one-handed weapon you wanted to, whether it was rapier. Oh, now it was a beautiful thrust. Imbricata over the parry, straight into the chest. That was very quick. So because it was a thrust into the chest, that was two points from blue. Um, some of us are used to the tournaments where you gain points and you try to accumulate the most points. This is one where you're trying to lose the fewest. Alex is changing his footwork, taking advantage of the fact that... He has two weapons. 
and both weapons are of the same length, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but just in the moment he was changing, his opponent took the opportunity to make an attack. Which is the... A key time. Yep. Occupied with his feet. Although he didn't see any hits land, so we resume the fencing. So, one of the things that you see in one-handed weapons that you don't see very much in longsword is a valid strike to the legs, where they are present and available to strike. Ooh, that was a lovely thrust to the body, but I think the cut slipped over the parry. I believe so. Uh, with the response to the head. And indeed, that's what they've scored. That was that. So and that was three exchanges, and in three exchanges, the blue fighter lost all five of his points, while the red fighter only lost, I believe, two. Three total. So Alex Kotorakis in uh, the red outfit and in blue is going to fight for bronze. Derek Wise will be fighting for first and second. So we have Jeremy Steffuk from the Western Swordsmanship Technique and Research, or Worcester. He's going to be in blue, and Zach Kochansky from the Pioneer Valley Fencing Academy will be in red. So we see... Uh, Again, a very heavy emphasis on the rapier. In the earlier rounds of the tournament, a wide variety of weapons were used. I was judging matches with broadsword and targe, with single saber, with sword and buckler. Uh, but here it's become a very rapier-focused uh, game, yep. simply because it's such an effective weapon for one-on-one -on -one dueling. So we're seeing here rapier and main gauche. The um, interesting thing with rapier and main gauche is that while the main gauche is usually used as a defensive weapon or a deflecting weapon, it can also be used as a thrusting weapon itself. Exchange of thrusts, both of them managed to slip past the parries. Some footwork moving in and out, finding range, finding the opening. Yeah. Looks like Zach is trying to test his opponent's measure and work out what the distance he can pull an attack at is. Without getting so close, he can't. He can still successfully parry. This is a very difficult match to judge just in general, only because... In so many weapons moving. Yeah. In the UK, we use a uh, judging system with multiple judges watching the fight from fixed angles, um, which is much more uh, heavy on the uh, event staff, but does give uh, clearer information about precisely which hits occurred. Oh. Stop thrust with the dagger during the rush. And Jeremy's uh, definitely dagger hit. needs to be bent back into position. I believe Zach also got a thrust to the torso. Zach's to reach over, though. I believe it was with his uh, dagger. His dagger as well. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I believe they were successful in getting the rapier out of the way. Cleared the blades and entered underneath them. <laughs> but the dagger especially is so incredibly hard to parry. I think uh, Zach had gotten a thrust onto the leg there, but there was a lot of stuff happening. And, mm. and there wasn't, his rapier blade is quite flexible and there wasn't significant bend, so there may have been a thrust which touched but had no forward presence. Oh. And generally that will not score in the, uh, the rules of this tournament. So, one of the... Um, Big differences that we'll see. So, uh, Zach has called for a video replay. There's something that um, IGX has done for a few years now, which is a 
video instant replay. We have two camera people at fixed angles who will record the, uh, the exchange and in the case of a request for a video replay, the judges will watch it and the, tech, the technology that they have actually allows you to slow-mo exactly what happened. In this case, there was definitely a good thrust from Blue Fencer um, and Red Fencer thinks he might have made the response. Based on Blue Fencer's comments, it seems like it might have fallen just short, which can always be the most difficult thing to judge or evaluate. Um, mm -hmm. Especially as a fencer, whether my thrust perfectly hit or whether it was a fraction off. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult because we are just human and we do have an interesting um, system of judging for IGX that did well last year and I think it done, did very well this year. Yes, the judging in general has been of a, of a good high standard. Matches have been won by the people who should be winning with reasonably close to the margins they should have been winning by Yeah, uh, most of the time. And given the number of matches we fought over the last two days, that's really no mean feat. No, no. I mean, we have a director and a judge who are handpicked by the staff to be some of the best directors and judges that are coming to the event and indeed are coming, you know, are in this area, yeah. this area being New England or... The From upper Florida Atlantic. Abroad sometimes. Yeah. I think we both judged a pool or two. Yes. I judged a pool of mixed weapons. I was a coach for the beginner longsword. Mm. And I judged a pool of the open. Ah. So the because it was a. Was successful. The thrust hit. And because it was a double, and they were both at zero points, it is now sudden death. So it is the first clean exchange. We'll win the match. These are two very equally matched fencers, which means that the judging becomes particularly important. I don't envy the job of either of these, uh, no judge or director. Oh! oh. oh. That was a very nice leg strike from Zach. Pulled a new trick out of his game. And just clips it. So that means Zach Kuchansky will be going on to our first, place, first match. place match, and Jeremy Steflik will be going on for bronze. So, as I said, mixed weapons is kind of a staple here at IGX. They do this every year, and it is a lot of fun to watch. It is not something that is easy to judge, and it's not something that I've ever done, mostly because it's just but it's a very interesting tournament. You do see some really interesting combinations, especially in the earlier rounds. I was watching a gentleman yesterday fencing with saber and sickle. Nice. Uh, and he landed a lovely exchange by controlling their wrists with the sickle and then thrusting over. Yeah. Uh, I saw one gentleman attempt his pull with just a messer. It's a bold choice. It was a bold choice. It did not work out well for him because the two of the fighters in his pool were saber fighters and the other two were rapier fighters. Yes. Voluntarily choosing the much shorter weapon makes your job extremely difficult. Yes. Yeah, because it was a it was a messer. It wasn't a Langus messer or a uh, Kriegs messer. Some nice short one-handed piece. Yep. Very effective if you can get in, but getting there is a challenge. Yes. Uh, we actually saw a couple of um, messer classes this weekend, and it's it is a very uh, interesting weapon to do. Um, Absolutely. But the, the length difference between Messer and Rapier was just almost too much to overcome. Yes. It can be done. I've seen it done a couple of times, but it's extremely challenging. Yeah. The Rapier is so long and the point moves so fast. Establishing control becomes extremely difficult. Yeah. So we have Alex Kodorakis with New Hampshire KDF and Jeremy Steflik with Western Swordsmanship Technique and Research. Alex was our two rapier fighter from earlier, uh, so his style should be interesting to watch again from the other angle. And again, both of these fighters have fought through a pool to get to this position. And an elimination set of pools as well, I believe. I believe so, yes. Uh, it was... I think six pools and then three pools, so... Yeah. They're both very tidy fences, resting their feet not tiring their arms before the match begins. Mm -hmm. Small technical issues with setting up the scoring. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter where it is, HEMA will be HEMA and we will yes. have a little bit of fun.
Because really, we're playing with swords. Exactly. The prizes are cool, but the real point of this is for the enjoyment and the fun of it. Oh, yeah. All right, while we're dealing with that technical issue, I'm going to mention one of our sponsors, the Lance Connect Emporium. This is, I think, their first year being a sponsor for IGX, but they do really fantastic messers, speaking of weapons we were just talking about. Um, they're one of the very few companies on the market who are making messers uh, with a correctly peened noggle. Uh, so the nail, the projection that comes out of the side of a messer, should be punched through the entire thing and folded over on the other side of the blade. Uh, most of them are simply cast, but these are properly constructed in the historical method. And we're back to the fencing. The answer in there cautious in their approach. Those two rapiers can thrust from anywhere. That exchange blocked. Thrust missed. Ooh. That was a that very nice... That looks like nice. the thrust under from blue came through and the thrust over from red missed. Yeah, it looks like Jeremy was able to uh, block Alex's counter Left thrust. He, he blocked one of them and dodged the other. Yeah. One of the uh, dangers with um, fighting with two rapiers is not getting them tied up on each other. Yes. <laughs> it seems Alex is very familiar with how his two rapiers interact not only with the opponent but with each other. He's certainly deliberately trying to bring them together sometimes uh, to establish a very strong control of the opponents. Oh my oh. god. <laughs> yep, that was a very good thrust Lovely from thrust. blue. Uh, the question is simply whether the descending cut was caught on the dagger or made it to the mask. And the cut made it past the dagger. Not quite a high enough parry. Almost. Oh. oh! It looks like Alex was able to get that thrust in but without a response. I don't think uh, Jeremy was able to make that. Uh, oh, they saw the thrust to Alex. They thru saw the both thrusts. Yes. And with it looks that, like Jeremy managed his distance just perfectly and placed a stop thrust right on the edge. Ah. <laughs> and the thing all the fighters forget because they're having too much fun fighting. Yeah. And our third place winner is Jeremy Staffleck. And again, Jeremy is with the Western, His Western Swordsmanship Technique and Research, or Worcester. Gold medal match, Derek Weiss in blue, Zach Kuchansky in red. This isn't the last we'll see of Alex either. He's actually back for the finals of the Open Longsword later. Alex, very versatile fencer. he is a really good fencer. I got to face him in the Elims today. Yes, so did I, and he, he, uh, he did a number on me, for sure. I was lucky enough to keep distance with him the entire time, so... Yes, but you're three inches taller than me. <laughs> and it yeah. turns out that helps. That's okay, Alex is about four inches taller than me. <laughs> All right, a little bit of uh, advice from the coaches. Again, I think we have just a slight delay on the uh, technical side. So we're going to take the time to mention another one of our sponsors, Kevitson Armory, Historical European Martial Arts. Kevitson was a sponsor last year. I think it was their I first year so, sponsoring. Probably. They're fairly recent on the human team, but they're a Russian supplier who started to break out of Russia into the wider world. I'm doing some really interesting uh, swords and fetters and sabers in particular they've become known for recently. So this is our first and second place match. I believe uh, Ian said that... This the is the one for the Messer. The beautiful Messer. It's absolutely stunning, a really glorious piece of construction. I'm a little jealous, but... I am too. <laughs> Again, we have Rapier and Main Gauche.
trying an appell, looking for commitment that he can, ex he can exploit. Oh! oh. And that thrust just worked it through. There was a dagger across the body. It might have been late. All right, it looks like the thrust from blue did not land, but the dagger thrust from red did. Mm. Or at least that's how they scored it. Yeah. Lovely leg slip for that cut. That was beautiful. Nice cut to the leg, then just stepped out of the way. Without even moving his body, though, just perfect control of the, the, where his weight was and how he was moving. Well, that'll be interesting. This is the sort of thing which is very hard to judge with the rapier and dagger. So many weapons moving so fast. And the turning of the bodies and movement forward Passing and backward. around each other. Very, very difficult exchanges to evaluate. So I believe all of our mixed weapon finalists are also fighters from Open Longsword. I remember facing uh, Zach Kachowski he was in our elimination pool as well, wasn't he? Yes. He was. Uh, very quick, very good control of distance. Yes. So while the judge and director are uh, conferring and reconstructing the match and deciding which strikes were quality, which strikes did land. So. Red is discussing with his coach whether to use video and decides to accept the call. And we're even at three to three, with two exchanges to go. Ooh. Made the timing that time and just managed to dodge the slip. Now all the pressure is on Red here. If he doesn't make this clean, he's going to lose the match. So Derek has an opportunity. He could attack suicidally, but you don't get to the finals of mixed weapons by choosing to, to attack suicidally. Oh. oh, I think they saw that thrust go through. Yeah. It looks like it walked just over the parry, bent on the outside shoulder. Yep. And it's a clean match. Match good. <laughs> Great fencing from both fencers. Really clean and lovely. And that is our first place winner in mixed weapons, Derek Wise with Boston Armitsari. And second place is Zach Kochowski with now Pioneer Valley Fencing Academy. Uh, we have Derek Adams from Nicholson So the Beginners Tournament is a really interesting event here at IGX. They take people who are new to tournament fencing. Um, and for their first pool stage, they're running in groups uh, with a dedicated coach who gives them advice and helps them work through their matches, get the, help them get used to the tournament environment. Um, and you see some really fantastic fencing come out of it. It's a great initiative and really a good idea to help get people into the competition scene. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Um, it's really fa fantastic just from the sense that uh, you're, you have four fighters who are grouped with somebody who isn't their regular instructor. Yeah. Somebody who can still talk to them. Um, my, I'm a Fiorist, and all four of my fighters were uh, Fiorists. And we have begun. Oh! oh! That was a nice strike from Blue. Blue took a rising parry from the left side, cut back inside to the face. This is Connor Kemp Cowell here with a very assertive hand on the director's staff. Oh! Yep. Uh, Connor is an excellent fencer in and of himself. Again, he was one of the people who was. No, he was not in our pool this no, year. But he was the top seed into the elimination round in Open Longsword. He was. 
So again, the... Uh, a really t very tidy fencer with a specialism in Vardy, which is extremely unusual. He does it very well, too. And uh, we see a Entering grapple, grapple. A grab with a sword, but there's... <laughs> so, um, Blue Fighter had come in, gone through the Krieg, came to a grapple at the sword, was rolled red sword, and placed his blade against the neck. And began sawing repeatedly. Certainly not pleasant to be on the wrong side of there. Yep. Um, I'm not actually sure if that's a scoring action in this tournament, so we'll have to see what happens. So there's no slices to the body, or any slice to the body, or head has to move the body part. Yeah. Now well, the head was definitely moving under pressure, so it might well go through. Yeah. But we'll see what they decide. It's one which is meriting a long judge discussion here. And we have a call. And they're counting the slice. And that is matched. That was a clean fight in three exchanges. Wonderful work by Blue Fencer. Really nice control and distance. So Travis Maya is our uh, coach for Red Fighter. And I believe he was just asking for a clarification on rules. So while they're looking uh, at... So the, uh, the slice only scores one point in this rule set, apparently. Ah. Uh, so there is a uh, way that it can well, score two points. Going. We'll have a full explanation in a moment, I think. But I haven't read the rules in enough detail. Yep. The two-point call stands. Control in the grapple, I think, establishes the second yep. point for the slice. <laughs> so one of the problems with some gear, getting out of it so you can pre be presentable. Understanding how you get into and out of your equipment is an extremely important part of beginning to fence in tournaments. If you're ever working with a coach, be sure to be able to explain to them how you prefer to wear your gear. It really helps them help you. So. <laughs> and Garrett Adams with Nickel City Longsword will be moving on to our first place match. Jason DeAngelis with Western Swordsmanship Technique and Research. Worcester will be moving on to the bronze medal match. So our next match is going to be with Colin Mandris from Nickel City Longsword and Keith Lung also from Nickel City Longsword. Nickel City brought a lot of fighters to the beginning tournament and they've done very well. I was right behind. behind and made a cut to the hand. Cut to the arm on red, minus one red. Minus yeah. one red. So Blue Fencer moved his sword to pull out red's cut and then hit the arm as the, uh, as the arm extended. Fighter, are you ready? Fighter, are you ready? Fight! Oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Um, the last match was between Garrett Adams and Keith Lung. This one is between Jason DeAngelis and Colin Mandras. The only reason I know that is because uh, Western Swordsmanship Technique and Research, Worcester, has a very distinct palette for all their fighters. Ah, uh, yes, they all wear the same jackets, don't they? Yep. Now I remember. Ooh. Thrust under, possibly to the body, and cut down. So one of the, uh, one of the things to watch out for... The strike that came up underneath from blue was insufficient quality to score a point. Yeah, it didn't quite bite as a thrust, at least not with deep commitment. Nice exchange. Blue is moving very cleanly. Oh. And a mistake by blue going for the low line when the upper line was open. Red to 
lost from blue to red's body. Minus two each. Minus two each. And that will be matched to red fencer. So our red fencer, Colin Mandris, with Nickel City Longsword, will be moving on to the first place match. And Jason D'Angelis with Worcester will be moving on to that bronze medal. So we're going to give uh, Jason a moment to catch his breath, and then he will be fighting for the bronze medal in the beginner longsword. All right, while they are getting set up, going to talk about one of our uh, probably best um, supporters is the HEMA Alliance. The HEMA Alliance is the um, organization that is responsible for providing insurance and uh, safety standards for HEMA in the United States. Not all members or not all fighters and clubs are part of the HEMA Alliance but the Hema Alliance does good things for many clubs. Fight! And we've begun. Oh, that was very quick. So, our red fighter got hit in the arm. Jason is moving in. Oh. So again, that was a very quick strike. Both, both fighters were able to make a strike into the head, but they were not able to make opposition strike with cover. Oh, oh. oh that was a nice cover from Jason to uh, cover the incoming attack from uh, Keith and then counterattack with a strike to the head. And while the judge and director are conversing and deciding, the uh, coaches for the fighters, taking the time to talk with the fighter, give him the some... So they gave the strike from red to blue. Blue fighters asked for a video review. So while they are doing a video review, let we're going to bring up our event sponsors again. And again, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I am going to say that these event sponsors are all providing something for... Upon video review, oh, video review is done. ...from right to blue's place was completely flat. So we are going to replay the pass. So they are going to check the video review again. The uh, first cut from red was flat. The coach is asking to see if the um, pommel was in time and in fact something that would be a scoring action. So again, the judge and director are looking at the video review to uh, determine if there should be points awarded. <laughs> So, while the uh, pommel might not have been struck against the mask, uh, there is, again, a safety issue that we all try to adhere to where... You can score a pommel simply by having the position and showing the clear intent to do so, um, which does sometimes lead to careful questions about whether the situation was clear enough. <laughs> All right, so the pommel to the mask is a one point scoring action. And we're at 2 2 on the last exchange. All to play for. Oh. 
It looked like his change of cuts, but I couldn't quite tell the targets. Time for a tie break. So because this is for bronze, we can't leave it as a tie. We are going to have a sudden death, which means the first clean exchange will win the match. Will an unclean exchange win the match in the case of a two to one? I'm not sure of the rules here. I do not believe so. I believe in the event of sudden death, it is a clean exchange, meaning that one person and only scores one a person point is hit. The other yes. does not. Ooh, so close. All right, my view was completely blocked by Travis Mayotte. There was a cut to the head and a possible counter cut to the arm, and then a late following cut to the arm by the same guy who did the cut to the head. Uh, so Blue Fencer definitely made a hit. I couldn't tell whether Red Fencer made a hit either from my angle. That was also obscured. And nobody was sure. This is some really lovely crisp fencing. It is. And it's, it's again, interesting to note that this is the beginner tournament. Yeah, most these of these fighters, guys have a year or two of experience at most. They might have fought in another tournament. Most of them haven't. This is their first experience. Under this pressure. But any of these four in the finals would have acquitted themselves very finely in the uh, open long sword eliminations. So that was thrown out because in this, in this uh, rule set, the strong of the sword is not a scoring action. For cuts. For cuts. I mean, the strong of the sword is not a scoring action for thrusts either. No, but it does work for slices. It does. And we continue. This is one of the most tiring portions when you're in sudden death and you need to get a clean exchange. In a, uh, a tournament in the UK once a couple of months. Oh my. <laughs> once in a tournament in the UK, I fenced a seven exchange match followed by 13 sudden death passes to determine the winner. Oh, oh well done. Lovely, parry, clear the blade, and strike behind it. So our blue fighter, Keith Long, with Nickel City Longsword, is our bronze winner. So, uh, just a quick, <laughs> and unceremoniously, we get to go on to our uh, first and second place match. So, our first and second place match <laughs> will be between Garrett Adams in blue and Colin Mandras in red. They are both Nickel City Longsword fighters, so that means that they have experience fighting with each other. And indeed, it also means that Nickel City is making a complete sweep of the medal table for this event. That is true. And Nickel City is a a younger group. I believe they've only been around for about a year, maybe two. I'm not so familiar with the U.S. clubs, I'm afraid, so I'll trust your uh, knowledge on that. We have a left-hander versus a right-hander. Which is always fun to watch. Ooh! So... So with our uh Moving on to the second exchange. So it was a uh head after for hands exchange. He hit the head and took the hands on the after blow.
You know, it's one of those uh, things that we need to be aware of. Oh, nice grapple here. Oh, so close. Oh, and not quite there. These so are some of the most exhausting exchanges you'll ever see. A 10 second standing grapple with no, with no throw or finish. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things that I love is the standing grapple does go to a verbal 10 count. Yes, it's very clear. Oh! oh. Again, talking about the turf. Blue over Fighter just over committing his footwork, falling, and being punished for it. So falling under your own is a, a one-point loss. But, but since he was hit in the fall in the head, that was two. One of the things, as I was saying, about the grapple, the thing I like about it is it is a 10-second instead of a 7-second or 5-second verbal grapple. There really is a lot of time to try and work your way in and take the throw. And you saw there at about 7 seconds there were a couple of really solid attempts at trips and throws, um, but they were both defended by each fencer in turn. And if you cut off at five, it, it just, it gets messy. It leads to injuries. Whereas a You have to rush in a way that, oh, oh, nice. Faint on one side, change through and cut to the head behind. That was a clean cut to the head of red, minus two red. Minus two red. And we go into the last exchange with blue at two and red at one. Last exchange. Fighter, are you ready? Ready. Fighter, are you ready? Yes. Again, the pressure is on red to uh, at least get one point. If he gets one point, he takes it to sudden death. If he gets two points, he wins on the spot. And any double where he uh, scores two points, again, goes to sudden death. If he gets hit anywhere from blue, then blue will win or if he gets a shallow target as an afterblow. Yes. Oh! oh. <laughs> Blue fainted high with body faint and then committed to a low target, cut to the thigh, I think, um, which should be the win of the match. Again, our judges confer. One of the things I do like about this two-judge format is you don't have to use semaphores to try to guess what they saw. Indeed, because there's only two people's opinions to uh, incorporate, it's very easy to have a short conversation about exactly what you think happened, which makes it much clearer and easier to pick up the order of actions, the details of actions, and so forth. Oh, it was yeah. a head cut over the parry. It was a head cut over the parry. And that is match blue, Garrett Adams with Nickel City Longsword. And fighters showing each other a little bit of love, lifting each other off the ground in that hog. Again, these are club mates. Club mates and hopefully good friends. <laughs> Garrett Adams takes first place. Colin Mandris takes second. And they both fought very long and hard to get to that spot. Oh, absolutely. The beginner's tournament was not easy at all. The uh, pools format for it is quite unusual. Instead of fighting a normal pool, you fight a, uh, Another a team. group of your fencers are associated with a single coach as a team. And you fight every fencer in another team with a different coach. A uh, very interesting, uh, direct, sort of alternative competition format. All right. We are, we are moving to the uh, women's finals. And our first match is between Tana Smith with Rogue Fencing. And, and Cape, it turns out. Now that's dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh Ferret, who is our director. I am sorry, I'm laughing just a little bit because Connor Kemp Cowell came up with a standard for Tanya Smith with Trash Fan. And in blue, in red here, we have Elizabeth Beatty 
Uh, she's not listed with the club? She is with, she trains with Forte Swordplay and Athena School of Arms, mm. both in the Boston area. Two of the clubs that help run IGX. It's a collective event run by the Boston clubs. Ooh, and she's moving very quickly today. And our judges, we have Josh Ferrate and Rebecca Gloss. Rebecca's been doing some classes recently on the history of uh, Jewish masters in Hema. Uh, several of the German masters are Jewish, uh, and it's a really interesting aspect of the tradition which hasn't really been studied much. So she's doing some really interesting work there. She also does uh, classes on getting into historical research and mm. the understanding of how to begin researching and understanding what's going on. All right, looks like there was some Move. contact, but they no hit. Ah, yeah. There Those we go. Just making these lovely low line rising cuts to the torso, uh, pulling the bind high and cutting underneath it. While leaving her cross high as a, as a uh, cover. It's one of my favorite actions. I do it all the time. <laughs> all right. Looks like the strike to the body was judged insufficient or out of tempo. Hand hit before it, I believe. Ooh, I think that head cut might have made it through the parry by uh, Tanya there in blue. Yeah, I think that was the only scoring action that I, if I were judging, I would have called. Yeah. And given uh, when they called, that feels very likely to me. Yeah. I don't know if they'll score an after blow, but if it is an after blow, it'll be an after blow to the body. There's the head cut. With the loss exchange, it's 3-1. Elizabeth needs to make a clean two-point hit to bring it to sudden death. Tanya, I believe, was top seed into the eliminations and into the finals. She's fighting very well. And that's one, maybe an after blow. Yep. Which will be a match for blue. They called it clean, after blow late. But it wouldn't have made a difference yep. either way. So very lovely fencing by both, really dynamic and interesting. So we're going to see Tanya Smith moving on to our first place match, and Elizabeth Beatty uh, moving on to the bronze medal match. So one of the things that, um, one of the reasons that women's tournaments are really important to have is to give women a chance to not only fence against other women for uh, whatever reason that they prefer to fence other women, uh, but to give women a chance to fence against people who tend to be closer to their size. Absolutely. Long Point this year ran a, um, it seeded their initial pools by body type, um, size and weight. And that was a really interesting experience to fence in, fencing other people. I'm a fairly small, light guy. And a lot of the time when I'm fencing in a full open tournament, I'm fighting guys six inches taller than me, 20, 30, 50 pounds heavier than me. And especially when it gets to wrestling, that really tells. Yep. Um, and women's tournaments are a really great way to help work through some of those issues and also create clear representation about cool, about how women are part of this sport. Yep. All right, so our movement and fencing. Our match here is between Christina Twombly with Boston Armitsare, Armitsare and Stephanie Canton with Academy Scrimacy up in Quebec City. Yes. We had a fairly large co contingent of the uh, Quebecois <laughs> down here. Mm -hmm. Yep, we did. We had a uh, Academy Scrimacy from uh, Quebec, and we also had the Montreal Sword Fighters. Mm. There's a, another name in French that I did not get the pronunciation of before the broadcast, so I didn't mm -hmm. I We're apologize. not going to try and mangle their, uh, mangle their language. Um, but yes, it's been lovely to see the kind of the international flavor of IGX, and with Canada being so close, it's a really easy thing to try and reach. Yep. And Stephanie's strike just went around uh, Christina's guard. Lovely and outer step, went over the guard and hit to the head. Oh, it looks like Christina also landed also a strike landed to... Faint with pressure in the bind and cut to that outer arm. Uh, that lead sword forearm is a big target with longsword. And a really nice strike. Yes, it is. 
the uh, right forearm for most of our right-handed fighters tends to get beat up a little bit. And oh, yes. in the IGX uh, rules, the required gear highly recommends rigid forearms, but does not require it. Same again. Exactly the same exchange. Pulled the bind, drew, this, drew the strike, stepped outside it, and cut to the forearm. Which is actually one of the first plays from Fiore. Um, which makes sense. Within an hour two. It, yeah. Very early, very simple. Yep. Hit them in the forearm and run away. I only mentioned that it's the first play from Fiore because Christina is with Boston Armitsari, the of Fiore group. Fiore club. Ooh. Ooh. I think that was a head cut, but I didn't quite have the angle to see. I think Stephanie got a, uh, a cut to the head by Stephanie. And if she did, she's brought it to a draw. It's just a matter of, did Christina have an afterblow, and was there mm. quality from There Stephanie's? was definitely a rising cut which might have reached the hands, but I couldn't tell whether it was well-structured and with good arc. Short rising cuts are very difficult to make. We had an arc strike from red to blue, followed by an afterblow, the strike to the head, from blue to red. So, blue minus one, red minus two. So they've called the first cut from red to the arms, uh, which looks legitimate. I just saw the video replay. Uh, and red strike to the uh, head. I apologize. Blue is declining their strike. They're uh, reversing their scores. No, blue is um, saying that there was a confusion about the color. Ah. It was minus two blue, minus one red, because Stephanie made the strike to the head. The much and more reasonable. Christina did make the strike to the arms. Yes. And this is just the honor that you see between sword yes. fighters. This is a, a rule set which allows fighters to decline or correct calls against themselves. Uh, you can't try and call in for your own favor, but you can definitely turn down things you were awarded that you think are incorrect. Yep. So fighting for gold, we have Christina Twombly. Fighting for bronze, we have Stephanie Canton. So, sorry, it might be Kantan. I, I am not good with French or uh, French Canadian pronunciation, so I do apologize for any um, missteps. It's all right, I'm English. It's Canton, right? See, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I love about you? I was really hoping you had an answer for that one. <laughs> Sorry. The uh, English are famously terrible at foreign languages for anyone from a place which isn't England uh, trying to understand what's going on here. So, Anytime I'm traveling in Europe, I take a sign saying, I'm very stupid and only speak English. Please help me get to where I need to go. It worked great. <laughs> All right. So we have uh, Stephanie Canton in blue and Elizabeth Beatty in red. Ooh, looks like a double thrust to the head. I missed the details of the exchange. Uh, I think looks Red like hesitated before striking and didn't right. actually finish before the halt. Ooh. Uh, tip to the head and then cut to the arms. So we're seeing actually a little bit of a height difference. In our first match between Tanya and Liz, and they were similar very similar size. And with Christina and Stephanie, they were again very similar sizes. So, you know, being height. taller, there's the, the thing we call the donut of death where you can reach and they can't, and it really does play into fencing. Mm -hmm. But the uh, height does not determine your ability in the ring. No, absolutely. There it's are plenty of short fencers who are very good. Um, ooh. Hand cut by red there. Yeah. But it definitely does make it a little bit more challenging, especially to get to deep targets when you need to get the points in, which is where red is now. She needs to get to the deep target to make the win. Oh! oh. And again, went high with the hands and cut underneath to the, body, to the body. But at the same time, Liz cut down to the head. Hmm. So. Did it go through is the question. I actually... From my perspective, I thought Liz's strike to the head and landed. I questioned. Right, so 
I think the head strike was parried. Uh, blue cut to the arm or body, and then red responded to a similar low line target because the hilt was high, which takes the match to blue for third place to Stephanie Conte from Addis Academies Tennessee. Yeah. But beautiful fencing from both fighters. Really lovely fencing. Wonderful fencing from both of our fighters. In our final match, Tanya Smith in blue, Christina Twombly in red. <laughs> so, they're the, asking if we can switch the fighter colors because one has a red jacket, one has a blue jacket, and they're fighting in exactly their opposite colors. That's not going to be confusing at all. The judges are preemptively apologizing for fighters in case they get the colors wrong at any point. And it's it's perfectly reasonable, honestly. Mm. It's a mistake I've made before, certainly. Especially with this system where you're calling points against a fighter, so you're trying to call the wrong color exactly. the way you usually would anyway. Uh, I can really get mixed up very fast. So Christina Twombly from Boston Armatsari and Tanya Smith from Rogue Fencing are fighting for... First Christina place. with the lovely blue and yellow spez jacket in the red, and Tanya with the lovely red spez jacket in the blue. Of no. Oh. Oh. That's a very nice strike from Tanya. Of Tanya no. drew an attack, took a hanging parry, cut to the outside arm, and returned to her parry before the afterblow. Of no. Tanya's uh, spez jacket is actually a spez ringen jacket. It's a very light jacket that you... Um, very mobile, but you feel every single hit. Yep. I was actually fighting in a Spez ringing jacket before I switched to the JF fencing jacket. And one of the uh, biggest tricks to that is to pad up underneath the jacket. Mm. Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things that the fighters there were doing was apologizing for any over-aggression. continuation video on the halt, especially. So they're counting Blue's long draw. Uh, Red, attempted, Red attempted to control the blade. Blue drew it out, and Blue has declined their point. We fight the second pass again. Ho! Oh. Oh. Blue went behind, made a cut, and it's whether the, qu the thrust managed to land. It looked like, from our point of view, and we got a, the point of view exactly the opposite from the camera, that the point just laid on the jacket. I mean, the point was just over and Tanya was stepping underneath the attack, which is a valid strategy for a, tall tra for a short fencer. They scored minus two to each fencer. So they counted the... They counted the uh, thruster slice, uh, possibly as a slice to the neck, I'm not quite sure. Oh! And the grappling. I, Any action? Think, I'm not I sure. think Christina wrapped Christina up. Christina brought her sword online, but I didn't see a continuation to the thrust. So I think uh, Christina wrapped up Tanya's sword, brought the sword back for a thrust to the body. As um, they may have called the hit for showing the thrust. So I'm watching the Twitch, the Twitch chat. Um, thank you for. Uh, saying that we did a good job with Stephanie's name. It, we do try. Even if the English occasionally joke about not trying. But they're making a correction to the previous scores, uh, it looks like. The Schnitt to the Mask uh, scored in a previous exchange should probably only have reached one point. Um, so we potentially should be tied at this, uh, at this point in the exchange. All right. Well, I guess we'll find out shortly exactly what the scores are going into the final exchange. While they're looking, we're going to mention our HEMA Supply sponsor once more. Again, HEMA Supply sponsors uh, one of the prizes, actually probably more than one of the prizes I for think IGX. four prizes in total? Something like they that. They provided three for staffing and one for possibly beginner's longsword. Uh, they tend to uh, offer uh, prizes like the sparring gloves for mm. several fighters. And Josh is back. 
one point. So there is a correct answer. We're probably getting a point back into it. I just want to make sure that we're all okay. I do apologize. So the schnitt from the uh, previous double, I believe. Yes, they've corrected the score. It was 4-2 to blue. And in the grapple, red took two points off blue fencer, so it will be 2-2 going into the last exchange, I believe. Indeed it is. Everything to play for, final exchange. They just need to not double at the same point. Point value. Unless they want to play sudden death. Ooh. Oh! I think red and blue made a cut to the arms and then red followed with a cut to the back. But it's very difficult to tell that sort of action without the perspective of the judges, especially on the other side for the potential cut to the arms. I think you're right. I think we have a cut to the arms. And I think that's 1-1 one, one and probably sudden death. If it's the action, I believe it is. <laughs> yep. And oh, oh, they scored the after blow to the head. So that would be match to red. Our director here, Josh Ferrat, is not super familiar with scoring uh, the negative scoring, and reversing the fighter colors for every scoring point is sometimes getting to his head. But our winner, it looks like, is Christina Fombley, the red fencer in the blue jacket. And our second place in the women's longsword is Tanya Smith, the blue fencer in the red jacket. And that was a very close match, despite the fact that Christina won. Uh, very small changes to the fencing could have produced very different outcomes. So, our four fighters for the Open tournament are Stephen Cheney with the Medieval European Martial Arts Guild, or MIMAG. Laurent Thierry Santerre with Academy Scrimacy, Alex Kodorakis with New Hampshire KDF. You've seen him before. And Harley Jealous, sorry, Harley Jalis with the New York Historical Fencing Association. Harley's been spending the day taking photos, so it'll be interesting to see how well warmed up he is, especially against Steve, who is very tall and has very good control of distance and thrusting and cutting. Uh, Steve is an excellent fencer. Uh, Steve is did also he win a giant. Gold or silver here last week, last year. I can't um, remember offhand. I think he got gold last year. Possibly. Silver? Silver. Gold. Yes. Last year, he lost to Eddie Lewis in the final. Eddie was one of our demonstrations for ringing in the red shorts earlier. Uh, but Steve is still a very tidy fencer, and he cleaned out Eddie 5-0 in the eliminations this year, so he seems to be really on form. Both fighters are fantastic, but we're seeing a height difference here of about one mile. So Stephen Cheney has been training not only oh, oh, mutual cuts to the, uh, they're going to both count as the head. <laughs> so for uh, this rule set, a cut to the body is only worth one point and a cut to the head is worth two points. But from the neck up is worth as the head. From the shoulder where it's no longer the arm to the top of the head, all counts as head. Oh, really? Okay. So a, Oh! Steve took the parry, made his virtue the head, and then wrapped up the arm to prevent the afterblow. Well done. Really lovely exchange. <coughs> yeah. Action was blue out of the head. Clean hit blue, minus two red. Minus two red. And I am really appreciative of Travis Mayotte, who is jud or directing, um, providing a clear explanation of exactly the action scored. Uh, Oh, as somebody who travels a lot for fencing, uh, I'm a great fan of directors who explain the actions they're scoring and why they are or aren't scoring them because it makes it much easier as the fencer to understand what's going on. Yep. Here we had a thrust of the body with a response by cuts of the arms. This sort of double is very common in left versus right fencing because the lines aren't closed in the same way as usual fencing. All right, and that is a very quick match. Harley Jalis is moving on to the bronze medal match, and Stephen Cheney is moving on to the gold medal match.
So, Travis Mayot is our um, director, and he's actually a fencer from MKDF. He uh, didn't compete in Open Longsword this year because he picked up a slight injury winning a medal in Ringham uh, and has a twinged rib that he can't uh, fence effectively with. Yep. Well, so he did me the favor of warming me up for my first pool match, and it was really fantastic. Travis is a great fencer, working on some really interesting interpretation and ideas. And John Moran is a instructor with Worcester, the Western Swordsmanship Technique and Research. Yes. So they are Who both we've seen earlier today. And also the bronze medalist in cutting. Yes. So Laurent Thiel, Thiel Santerre with Academy Scrimacy, and Alex Kodorakis with New Hampshire KDF. They're I remember from earlier that Alex has a particularly fantastic zvirch. Uh, and it looks like a thrust to the hand from Alex. And possibly a cut from Laurent, I'm not quite sure. A difficult exchange to call a hit on. Alex is declaring a hit to his own arm. Red White is acknowledging a hit to the arm. Well done. Very honorable. Um, Absolutely. Final call is red thrust to Blue's arm. Blue's cut to Red's arm. Minus one each fighter. And the thrust did land. Ready. Fight. So again, with the IGX rule set, you are allowed to call exchanges against yourself. Yes. So if you don't feel that your um, strike landed, you can deny the point. If you got hit and okay. the judges don't see it, you may acknowledge it. Oh. Ooh. That was a beautiful work okay, from Alex. Like Lauren has just declared the hit to the head, so exchange of hits to the head, I believe, for the exchange. Two closely matched fencers. So Lauren. Minus two red, minus one blue. Minus two red, minus So the initial strike from Alex on the way in was a strike to the arms. And then he followed with the search to the head, but this rule set scores the first hit, not the deepest hit. Well, Loren is a really interesting fencer. He does a lot of Highland broadsword and was doing great work in the mixed weapon pools with broadsword uh, and targe versus rapier and dagger, or even with broadsword alone versus rapier alone. Fantastic reach and control of his body and legs. Oh. Ooh. So it's through, and, and then back off target, and then a very late cut to the head, which almost certainly will be judged out of tempo. So just a quick note on the rings here. The rings here at IGX are very small rings, but they also use uh, what we call fuzzy borders or soft borders. So when you see the fighters get to the edge of the ring, that's not a ring out. Also, ring outs don't score in this rule set. So. Yes. The action is broadly constrained to the ring, and if the fighters just run out of the ring without anything happening, it will be reset. Blue declines his thrust. Calling no action. Meaning no exchange is scored. Yes, I do really like the small lanes. They prevent the needless circling that you see in some of the very large rings. Uh, but they allow all of the lateral and sideways movement. Oh, wow. Cut to the arm and hanging parry by red. Clean hit red to blue's arm. One point for blue. And we go into the last exchange at two to two. Final exchange. Ready. Fight. Ooh. Parry and parry. Blue made the cut to the arm and parried the afterglow. And to stop the uh, Lovely action. Lovely right hanging parry, which means almost certainly this will be blue to the finals and Alex to the bronze. And to stop the action, uh, we had Travis actually step in with that big judging baton. And then final red attack Clean strike blue, minus one red. Yes. All right, looking forward to our bronze medal match in just a moment. Also moving to fight in the third place match, Alex Kodorakis. So Alex Kodorakis and Harley Jalis, Jalis, will be going on to our third place match. Laurence Thiel-Santerre and St Stephen Cheney 
will be going on to the first place match. Yes. This will be interesting. Steven has a good few inches even on Loren, and Loren is a reasonably tall fencer. So after the um, tournament is over, we're going to take a moment just again to thank all, our, all of our sponsors and thank all of our uh, live stream and staff and yeah. our live stream viewers. Yeah, we're going to thank a lot of people um, because IGX, more than a lot of events, is about the community. We have not only um, the tournaments, which we're seeing the finals of here, but we have classes. We have discussion. We have a lot of things okay. that... And a little bit of love between the fighters. Yes. IGX is also interesting in an event being put on by a group of clubs together. Uh, most events are run by one club or one person, uh, but this one is run by all of the Boston clubs collectively. Uh, and they take turns taking the lead role in the organization of the, of the event. It's a really interesting thing to see and really has helped its longevity as an event. Oh, nice double cut to the hands. Lovely double cut to the hands there. Great use of distance and threat. And it's very important for uh, Harley to do that because he is suffering from a, a range difference. Yes. He's working up a significant reach disadvantage and doing it very finely. On the cross guard. Maybe incidental contact, but the cross guard took the full duration of that. Actions between the swords, nothing done to the body or the arms. Probably the most subjective part. Oh! That, that was that was a, a cut and a half straight to that head. Yep. I couldn't tell if Blue made anything. If he did, it was on the other side where we couldn't see. But we'll have an opinion from the judges soon. Yep. So one of the things that the rule set really um, emphasizes is the idea of a quality hit. Most of the quality hits um, is, deals with having the edge on alignment, a rotation of the sword. Both cuts made it through. Minus yep. Minus two each. Ready. Yep. Right. So a strike that is flat will not score a point. A strike that does not move sufficiently. Okay. Lovely movement. He created a step to one side to draw the parry out, draw the blade across, and a step outside, cut to the arm, and then return to the blade to prevent an afterblow. Blue strike, uh, sorry, red strike, blue's arm, strong in the blade, no quality, nothing done. But it was with the strong, he was a little too close. Ready. So, one of the rules for quality is striking with the middle to upper two thirds of the sword. Now, this is not as is commonly touted because you can't cut with the strong of the sword, but because the attacks with the strong of the sword will injure your opponent. Yes. Striking with the weak, the sword has some give in it uh, with the length of the lever and, the, and the, the firmness of your grip. Striking with the strong, you're basically smashing them. Yep. So, action in the middle, final action from blue is a Zerhal flat. Clean hit red to the arm, minus one blue. Minus one. So Harley strikes the arm. He cuts the arm as red raises his hands. Really nice use of timing and threat. And we're at 3-1 going into the final exchange. Red with the advantage. That's red armband, not red jacket. Red jacket is blue fencer. You know, that's one of the fun things. You know, I'm going to keep on saying something that will get interrupted by the action. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and that is one of the... Uh, Alex Katarikos' virtual is really quite something. I felt that earlier today, and let me tell you, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. It is one of the actions that he does really well. He will do three works in a row at descending heights on opposite sides of the body. So you get yeah. a hit to the head on the... Probably from his right onto your left side, a hit to the arm on the opposite side, and then a hit to the body to finish. Head on the arm, followed by three consecutive hits of head, body, head. First hit is scored. That is minus one for blue, minus two for red. 
And Harley Jalise is our third place bronze medalist at IJX. Given that he was taking photos until five minutes ago, it was really very impressive work from his part. Fantastic fencing. I did speak a little bit with Harley uh, before the finals, and uh, from this point on for the rest of the night, he will not be taking photos. And it's mostly because it's very hard to transition from one mindset to a fighting mindset and then back to a non-fighting mindset. Um, and he recognized that and was able to comment to the rest of the, uh, uh, the tournament organizers that he will not be taking photos for the rest of the uh, day. We do have, although you've said that, and he just, he's just grabbed taken the his camera, camera back. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have several other photographers here as well we documenting do. the event from various angles. And our gold medal match between Stephen Cheney in blue and Laurent Thierry Santerre in red. Again, Stephen Cheney is with MIMAC, the Medieval Martial Arts, or sorry, Medieval European Martial Arts Guild. And Laurent Thierry Santerre is with Academy Scrimacy. And again, Academy Scrimacy is out of Quebec, Quebec City, specifically. Again, Stephen is training not only in HEMA, but Kendo. Oh! oh! That was a beautiful thrust. Going to the outside line of yeah. Laurent's. There's a very small window in most longsword fencers between the cross of their blade and the shilt of their sword. And when you thrust through that, it's incredibly hard to make the parry in good time. On the way down, flip the leg, no quality. Clean hit blue, minus two red. Minus two red, second exchange. Lovely thrust. Mm -hmm. Steven has an extremely strong thrust game. It is a lot of fun to fence against him, I have to say. Oh. Again, exchanges, parries, and a separation. Some light touches. Oh! oh. It'll be interesting to see if they count Cheney's cut as arm or head. Cheney's cut looked like body to me, but I think Lorraine's cut may have been flat. I'm not 100% sure. I've just been shown a photograph. Lawrence Cup was with the edge. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Laurent was saying something to the director. Red thrust came in flat, however, landed with the point, buried in the mask blue. Blue's return cut to the upper neck head area of red. Two points each. Okay, they're scoring the exchange before the exchange I saw. It was so fast. Yeah. Ready. Ready. Fight. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Cheney has, among other things, a kendo background. Oh, oh lovely. Yeah. Hooked over the top and cut to the head. And in the kendo uh, tradition, you uh, kiai or spirit shout to start your fight. We are at one point to one point going to the final exchange of the gold medal match here. These are high level competitors who are do really well. Steven is very interesting. He's not just a competitor. Oh. One handed thrust that cut missed. To the hand. And a cut to the hand. It looks like the one handed thrust missed, judging from Laurent's uh, response. Yes. If they score it, I suspect he's going to decline the exchange. Though, even if he did land, uh, a one-handed thrust is only worth one point. Ah. They've called in for video review proactively. And Stephen is keeping his mask on to keep himself in the mindset. Stephen's a really interesting guy. He's both a very high-level competitor, but also he's a translator and an instructor. Uh, he taught a workshop here earlier this weekend, I believe. Uh, yes, he did. I do not remember what it was, but it was... I can't remember offhand, but at long point he did one on applying lessons from armored and mounted combat to longsword fencing. And some of his commitment to the forward attack might be drawn from that. 
Uh, and he's also done a great deal of translation of early uh, early Lichtenauer and related sources. Yeah, I actually, when I do read the Sutra Peter von Danzig, I use his translation. I think it's actually his like sixth or seventh translation. Yes. He decided a while ago that he wanted to translate, uh, be able to compare sources in translation without the uh, bias of different translators' opinions. And so he simply translated everything himself. And also, he's an expert fencer. We go around for a second. Okay. And Stephen Cheney for gold medal. That should be it for competition. Um, All right, before we uh, leave and go to that uh, event photo, and T, if you want, you can go to the event photo. I'm going to talk about the uh, sponsors real quick. I think I've said my piece about all the sponsors, all right. so I'll see you at the event photo with a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, actually, I think the uh, live stream will be ending if it hasn't already. So thank you very much. And you know, I'm going to sign off from this the way I sign off from all the podcasts. Until next time, I hope you're granted prudence, celerity, audacity, and fortitude in all that you do. Thanks for listening. <laughs>